So uh, we have been uh, in the series uh, for the past couple of weeks, Road Out. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, my name is Pastor Ariel. I'm one of the pastors of this uh, particular congregation. And we are going through the series on the book of Exodus. Now, how many of you have been learning something for the past couple of weeks about Exodus? Okay. Uh, we're still going through the miracles uh, for this entire year. That's going to be like our, our big series. And we're going through the plagues of Exodus, but we did not take any more time to go through each plague kasi baka madepress tayo, no? But anyway, so today happens to be the final plague. And, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about that uh, right now in uh, uh, chapter 11, which is the death of the firstborn. And then we're going to look at also uh, how God had provided a way of escape for the children of Israel through the Passover. You know, one Sunday, uh, I was preaching in Makati, and uh, on our way back, I was invited by Pastor Dennis uh, with their, uh, you know, brand new uh, place there in a hotel in Makati. So, after preaching, uh, we went back to Alabang, and I was not so familiar anymore with the uh, one way in Makati, so I used Waze on my way back uh, to Alabang. And so, I was following Waze. On my turn uh, to Ayala, I followed the instruction of Way. So Way said to me, make a left turn. So I turned left, and then make another left turn, I turned left. And it was a no U-turn slot uh, in Makati along Ayala Avenue. And so, of course, uh, there was uh, an MMDA waiting for me. It was a Sunday. Okay, ang sipag ng MMDA on a Sunday. I thought there's no MMD on a Sunday. But anyway, I stopped being a good citizen. I had to stop, give my license. And so um, I actually said, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, I just came from church. I'm not familiar with the road. But, you know, of course, I cannot use an excuse uh, following ways because of the clear sign there. But I clearly did not see the no U-turn sign. Believe me. I am not used to breaking the law. But anyway, so I was observing Waze and I was following his voice. And Waze turned, said, turn left. I turned left. And so anyway, so I said, I, I, I just came from the service. And so anyway, so um, I, I'm so uh, apologetic with my mistake. But, you know, I gave my license. For some reason, uh, I guess they found out I'm a pastor because I was actually also saying that I came from a service, you know. I'm not from here. I'm from Alabang. Uh, of course, dapat normally sinag ginagamit yun. But anyway, for some reason, he was able to find out I'm a pastor. And so, they talked about it. He was holding my license. And then, he gave my license back to me. And he said, Pastor, uh, ingat kayo. Uh, next time, alam nyo nang no U-turn. Okay? So, he let me go. Now, don't use that as an excuse. Okay? Don't say you're a pastor. <laughs> as a way of escape. Okay? But anyway, so he let me go without giving me a ticket. So what happened to me that day was I was passed over a citation or a ticket, not because of something that I've done, but merely by the favor of God. Now, how many of you are glad that when times like that, you get passed over? In times of judgment or in times of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a mistake, you get passed over. But I remember growing up, you know, when I would like to, like, play sports and basketball, when, my, when our uh, high school coach would actually say, okay, I'm dividing the class into two teams. There's going to be two team leaders, and I want you to choose your teammates. Normally, I also get passed over. Because I am a short guy in class, and I'm not that good in basketball, so I get passed over being part of a team, I, and I hate it. I hate being passed over. How many of you have experienced that? You get passed over, instead of you being part of that, you get passed over with an opportunity to play, or you get passed over with a promotion in your office. How many of you can relate with me? Or maybe you like a girl, but the girl likes somebody else. 
and you get passed over with her yes or maybe or maybe a time of coffee or a date you know we we don't like getting passed over when it comes to favor or benefits or promotion but when it comes to being judged when it comes to a mistake or receiving a citation we are so glad that we get passed over. You know, the story that we're going to be reading in a while is actually that time in Israel where the people of God got a Passover from a judgment that happened in the entire nation of Israel. And I want us to realize that this is the final judgment. For the past nine plagues, uh, it has always been uh, against the, Ish, uh, the Egyptians, and they suffered through each plague, the plague of darkness, the plague of flies, the plague of uh, frogs, the gnats, and so on and so forth. But in this particular case, you will see that God is making a distinction between His people and that of the people of Egypt. So we're going to be reading from uh, Exodus chapter 11, verse 1 to 7, and then we're going to jump to verse uh, chapter 12, 1 to 7. I'd like to invite everybody to stand with me as we read God's Word uh, this morning. Exodus chapter 11, uh, verse 1 to 7, and then we'll jump to chapter 12, 1 to 7, 12 to 14, okay? Exodus chapter 11, the Lord said to Moses, Yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh... And upon Egypt, afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn, everybody say every firstborn, every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, the highest in the land, who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle, not only the people, but even the animals. There shall be a great cry. Everybody say, great cry. Throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and and Israel. Let's jump to chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each uh, can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. A, ma a male, a year old, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. Let's jump to verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Verse 13, the blood. Everybody say the blood. The blood shall be a sign for you of the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. 
and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day for you, uh, sh this day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the preaching of your word this morning. I pray that you would help us to understand the essence of why you saved us in the first place and the importance of our dear Lord Jesus as the Passover lamb and how precious his blood is that saves us, cleanses us, justifies us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may all be seated. So this is now the final showdown between uh, God and Pharaoh. In fact, I believe that this is not really a showdown. It's more of like a showcase of God's power and God's authority over the gods of Egypt. Can you imagine if you are playing against the best team in the NBA and your village has a team? How many of you normally play basketball here? And you have a village team. You have got uniforms during summer. And then you're playing against Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors. Do you think that's a showdown? I don't think that's a showdown. It's a showcase of the glory and the supremacy of the Golden State. Or rather, if you're a Lakers, okay then. <laughs> Whatever your team is. And in this particular case, God is going against the gods of Egypt. And Pharaoh himself is considered a god among the Egyptians. And I believe that there is no match between God and the Egyptians. Now, in this particular case, you know, we've seen that in the past different plagues, the first nine plagues, Pharaoh's heart has been hardened every time. When Moses said, let my people go, Pharaoh would be pakipot. You know, sometimes he would say, okay, you may go, but, you know, you have to leave your cattle. Okay, you may go, but, you know, only the men. Okay, you may go. But then at the end of it all, in the ninth plague, he said, I will not let you go, and I don't want to see your face again. And the next time that I see your face again, you will die. Basically, what he said was a judgment against, him, against himself and against his people. You know, I believe that God is making a distinction between His people and the world. How many of you are God's people? Please raise your hand. How many of you know that the favor of God is upon us? Amen. And wherever we go, God is making a distinction between us and the people of the world. Amen. And I hope that when we talk about, you know, us being Christians, you know, that we represent God well in our campus, in our, uh, in our offices, hindi naman yung weird, right? You know, you know, when people ask you, for example, you know, if you want to make a distinction, how are you doing this morning? Oh, I'm anointed, you know. How are you this day? Oh, this is the day the Lord has made, you know. Hindi naman ganun ka weird, okay? But, you know, basically, the distinction is the favor of God, the blessing of God, the way we live, the way we speak, the way we treat our wife, the way we treat our children, the way we handle our finances, there's a distinction there and the way God blesses us. How many of you know that you don't have to run after the blessing of God because the blessing of God is running after us? Amen. The blessing of the Lord runs after His people. That's the favor of God. And I believe that God wants to make sure that each and every one of us feels His care and His presence. God wants to set us apart from the world, not because we're better, not because we're special, but because of His covenant love for each and every one of us. Amen. And I believe that God used the ten plagues basically to distinguish and to reveal Himself to Israel, His people. You know, since the time of Joseph, uh, you know, it was 400 years when 70 people came to the land of Egypt. 400 years have, has passed. And how many of you know that Egypt is not the ultimate promised land? Basically, it was a stopover. 
God had a promised land for His people. In fact, Canaan was their promised land. But it was during that time that Canaan was going through a famine and God had a plan to bring Joseph temporarily in Egypt so that he can preserve his family and provide for them in this great land. But even if the plan of God was for them to stay there for a short time, how many of you know that 400 years is not a short time? They were 70 when they started. By this time, after 400 years, the theologians are estimating that there's probably about 2 million Israelites in the land of Egypt. And that's the reason why Pharaoh was intimidated because he saw that they were such a great number and they decided to put taskmasters and, you know, uh, make them slaves lest they uh, agree with the, the enemies of Egypt and ally with them. So they became slaves and they started crying out to God. And it was this cry by the Israelites that basically precipitated the call of Moses. Moses was called by God to deliver his people Israel, not because Moses was great, or not because he was trained in the kingdom of Egypt, but because of the cry of the people of God uh, to him. It was with the ten plagues that God revealed his character and nature to the Hebrews, his sovereignty, his uh, power, that He is promise-keeping, that He is purposeful, that God hears. How many of you, God hears our prayers? Amen. And I appreciate the time that we have spent this morning, you know, praying for one another. God hears. God sees. God cares. You know, it's a time that He revealed His power, His justice, His judgment, and rule over natural forces. You know, I believe that it is during these times of testings, that God intimately reveals to us Himself. You know, in times of our grief, God reveals to us that He is our comforter. In times of lack, God reveals to us that He is our provider. Amen. Even in times of sickness, God will reveal to us that He is our healer. You know, I was with Pastor Wolfie. Pastor Wolfie is actually our senior pastor in Every Nation London. And, uh, you know, Earlier, I think earlier this year, he was diagnosed with uh, cancer, uh, stage four, and you know it came. It actually came from uh, a skin uh, cancer, and uh, it metastasized and actually spread throughout all his body. And the doctor earlier this year said that he had several, actually, a couple of months to live. Because of the spread of the cancer, he had a brain tumor, he had problems with his kidney, he had problems with his lungs. Basically, the cancer spread. And they believed God for a miracle. What happened was, uh, as they were praying, you know, he is getting better and better by the day. You know, the doctors were surprised that the cancer, though it's not totally out yet, yet it's being diminished in his system. So, kumbaga, the spread is not spreading, it's actually diminishing. How many of you know that is a miracle from God? Amen. And he was saying, you know, I, I could have died already earlier this year, but even until today, he is alive. And sabi ko sa kanya, of course, I, you know, in English, no? How are you? How are you feeling this morning? Anyway, he said that I still have this brain tumor, and he said, I don't think you can totally take it out because it's deeply embedded in my brain. But I asked him, how are you carrying on? He said, I take pain meds every single day, and by the grace of God, I'm okay. They just celebrated their 30th anniversary last uh, Saturday as a church. He was the one who founded that church, planted that church, grew that church by the grace of God. And from Ian e. Lona, they planted four other locations and he was preaching with so much anointing as if he was not sick. How many of you know that is the grace of God? And I was amazed. I said, God, thank you so much for your grace and your healing upon Pastor Wolfie Eclevin. Continue to pray for him. You know, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of it. He is from Every Nation London. Just Google it. Okay, find, uh, uh, find this uh, 
web, uh, website or uh, account in Instagram and let's pray for him. You know, normally it's during these times of need that God reveals himself as strong on behalf of his people. Amen. And I want us all to just, uh, you know, go through, let's all go through uh, three significant truths about the 10th plague and the Passover. The tenth and the final plague was the death of the firstborn. In fact, in this particular story, we would see that when God instructed Moses about the death of the tenth plague, he was not giving a get-out-of-jail card to the Israelites if they do not obey him. They have to obey a specific instruction or else even them, they themselves will experience a death in their family. Now, how many of you are firstborn in your family? Please raise your hand. Okay, I'm also an eldest, okay? Uh, and I cannot imagine the fact that if I was living in that time during, you know, the time of Moses, you know, I may not wake up the next day anymore. So I'm going to ask my dad, Dad, please make sure you follow instructions or else I'm not going to survive. So Exodus 12 talks extensively about the Passover. And when you talk about the Passover, it is the event in Israel's history that was the most recognized and the most remembered among all the feasts uh, in Israel because that speaks of a deliverance uh, of the people of God from slavery. And when you talk about this picture, it's an Old Testament picture of what we are in the New Testament. How many of you know that we used to be slaves to sin as well? That God delivered us from sin and God delivered us from curses of the law. And He had to use a deliverer. And who is our deliverer? Jesus Himself is a deliverer. Not only is Jesus our deliverer, but He's also our Passover lamb. And we're going to go through that in a while. And this is the story of God's redemption and God's deliverance. Number one, God's salvation requires faith and obedience. Everybody say faith and obedience. Faith and obedience. Basically, God told Moses what to do. And all the people had to do is to obey the instructions of the Lord through Moses. What was the instruction? Each family has to get a lamb without defect. About a year old. How many of you normally eat lamb chops? Okay? We eat lamb chops. We don't really see the lamb coming out, coming from, you know, where those lamb chops are coming from. But they were told, you get a lamb without defect. You are to get the lamb on the 10th day. It was a 10th day. Now, I'm wondering why it's the 10th day of the month. And when God told Moses... Get the lamb on the 10th day and you're to keep the lamb until the 14th day. And on the 14th day, you are to kill the lamb. There's about four days where in that lamb will stay with your family. Now, a lamb is a cute animal. If you have kids, they'd probably give a name to that lamb already. Right? They'd probably pet that lamb, feed that lamb, sleep with that lamb, take care of that lamb, give that lamb a bath, you know, uh, and enjoy the presence of that lamb for the next four days. And then what will happen after the fourth day of enjoying the lamb? <laughs> I think it's going to be very traumatic for the, for the kids. But if you are the firstborn, you will be happy that your dad is obeying the instructions of Moses because that is your life against the life of that lamb. God's salvation requires faith and obedience. And how sure are they that when this is done, that they will be saved that night? You know, it's kind of like uh, taking a board exam. Once you take the board exam, you don't know if you pass. You did your best. You studied. You take the exam. You're not sure if you pass. How many of you know that the period of waiting is a torture? And in this particular case, I think the overnight is a torture 
not for everybody, but particularly for the firstborn of that household. And I can only imagine the thoughts of the Israelites. They probably did not imagine the, the, the massive destruction that will happen uh, in, the, in the whole land of Egypt. The Israelites basically did nothing that deserved salvation. It's all about God's love. It's about, you know, God's hesed. Everyone say hesed. Hesed means the compassionate love of God. It's God's grace. It's a miracle of grace uh, that happened during this time. Nothing qualified the Israelites from being saved that night. You know, some scholars are saying that maybe the Israelites, you know, 400 years is a long time. They have not met the God of Israel. They have not met Yahweh or Jehovah. It was an oral tradition. Maybe their parents are just passing on the tradition from the time of Joseph and Jacob. After 400 years, maybe some of them are already uh, incorporated with the culture of the Egyptians. And even some of them are probably very familiar with the gods of Egypt. Maybe some of them are even practicing idolatry already. Maybe some of them are compromising already. I don't know. Maybe they're asking, where is this God that would have delivered us many, many years ago, but after 400 years, we're still here, and we're now slaves? Maybe they've been compromising and sinning already, but yet God had a plan. It's not about the Israelites' goodness. It's about the promise of God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he's about to fulfill even 400 years after. How many of you know that God is a promise-keeping God? Amen. God is a good God. When God gives a promise, he's able to keep that promise and fulfill that promise no matter how long we wait. Amen. Hopefully, hindi 400 years ang wait natin. The Israelites did nothing that deserved salvation. And God gave specific instructions for each household. And all they had to do is to wait. And all they had to do is to obey. In the same way, our salvation comes by faith. There's nothing that we can add to salvation. There's nothing that we can do that we can qualify for salvation. It's solely because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross. Amen. Secondly, God's salvation is free but not without sacrifice. The salvation that God is giving is not without sacrifice. In fact, an innocent lamb is to be a substitute. Everybody say substitute. Substitute for the guilty. And this was not the first time that God required a sacrifice. In fact, the qualification of the lamb is this lamb should be without blemish. Each household, as I said earlier, is to get a lamb without defect. Keep that lamb with the family from the 10th of the month to the 14th of the month. They will feed the lamb, watch over the lamb, and it will become personal to the household. It's not just a nameless lamb. By this time, I guess, I guess you know, they've you know, uh, been close to that lamb already, and yet the lamb had to be sacrificed. It definitely is going to be hard. For especially the children of that family, once they let go of the lamb. A lamb is always what God requires. You know, it's actually been a meta, part of the uh, meta-narrative of scriptures that every time, even in the Old Testament, even during the time of Adam and Eve, that a lamb has been required. Remember the time of the, uh, Adam and Eve uh, in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned, basically they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. And what God did was, God said, that is not the way to, to cover yourself. God had to sacrifice an animal and replace the fig leaves with animal skins. Now, I'm trying to imagine that uh, maybe at that time, they need one lamb per person because, you know, if you want to cover up, a lamb is just small, right? So, hindi pa gusto two piece right? So, maybe God had to place one lamb uh, animal skin for, for Eve and another uh, lamb animal skin for Adam. And so one lamb per person during that time. In Exodus chapter 12, the one we're reading earlier, one lamb per family is required. You are to take a lamb and you are to consume this lamb per family. Everybody say one lamb per family. 
Now, later on, God established in Israel the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. And it became one lamb for the nation of Israel. One lamb is to be sacrificed at the altar for the forgiveness of the entire nation of Israel. But yet later on, we see that when Jesus came in the New Testament, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. One Lamb for the world. Amen. Before it was one Lamb for each person, and then it became one Lamb per family, and it became one Lamb for a nation. And when Jesus came, the perfect Passover Lamb, it was just one Lamb for the sins of all mankind. Amen. That is the power of our Savior. Can we just give the Lord praise for that? One lamb for the entire sins of humanity. In fact, if we are to relate with God, we are to relate with Him on the basis of the lamb. Remember the time when um, Abraham was bringing Isaac to Mount Moriah and God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. And Isaac was carrying the wood and the fire, and he asked his father, Father, the fire and the wood are here. Where's the lamb? He didn't realize that he was supposed to be the lamb at that time, but God provided another lamb at the top of the mountain. Where's the lamb? And I believe that God is going to be asking us when we relate with Him, where's the Lamb? You know, we can come to church and be religious, but at the end of the day, where's the Lamb? It's not about the good things that we do. It's not about us being part of, you know, uh, 10 days mission or maybe we help in real life or give our tithes and offerings. God's going to ask us, where's the Lamb? Do you have a relationship with the Lamb? It's the Lamb that stands in between us and God. Where's the Lamb? My question for us today is, do you know who the Lamb is? Do you know the Lamb of God? First, uh, First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, For Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed. In fact, the original Passover during the time of Egypt in Exodus points to and prepares the way for Jesus, the Passover lamb. He is the once for all time Passover lamb. In a way, every time we partake of communion, and we're going to do that in a while, every time we partake of communion, we remember the Passover during the time of Exodus as a celebration of how God has delivered His people and that blood has to be shed in order for our sins to be forgiven. An innocent lamb suffered so that the guilty ones can be spared. This brings me to my third and final point. God's salvation requires the blood of an innocent lamb. And as you read the entire Exodus chapter 12, you will also see the reference, the heavy reference to the blood. Almost like every part of it, you see the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. My question is, why the blood? Because the life of the body is in the blood, according to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. God didn't just require a lamb. He required a dead lamb. And in order for the blood to be drawn out of the lamb, it has to be killed first. Blood represents life. And blood is a sign that life ended in order to become a substitute for our life. In fact, in verse 13 of Exodus chapter 12, can you all read this out loud? Uh, All together, one, two, three. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, what will happen? I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike 
the land of Egypt. It's about blood. And the whole essence of God's salvation and God's deliverance for the people of Israel during that time is the blood. Nothing that they have done qualified them for deliverance. It's just about the blood on the doorpost. They are to obey the instructions. They are to put the blood on the doorpost and on the lentil of their house. And that's it. God did not even inspect if the people are righteous in the house. God is just going to inspect the blood. And here we see that there are two perspectives when it comes to the blood. The first perspective is our perspective, humanity's perspective. During that time, the people of God, the blood shall be assigned for you. When you see the blood on your doorpost, it's your sign that something happened already. And in the second part, it says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Two perspectives. The first perspective is the, the perspective of the people of God when they see the blood. You know, it's, it's a way of saying, Lord, thank you for the blood. Because of the blood of Christ, my guilt has been atoned for. In fact, there are two words I want to introduce to us uh, today. It's a technical term or a theological term. First word is expiation. Everybody say expiation. Expiation is Jesus' sacrifice cleanses us from sin and removes the guilt from us. And this is the perspective of the people. When they see the blood, the impact of the blood that they see is, Lord, thank you for this blood because they knew that the guilt has been taken away from them because of the blood that they are viewing at the doorpost. Expiation. The second word is propitiation. We see this in the New Testament. Ever say propitiation. Propitiation is the wrath of God has been turned away because of the sacrifice of Jesus and the act of regaining favor because punishment has been carried out already. So when God sees the blood, His wrath is taken away. He's been appeased because how many of you know that the penalty for sin is death? We're familiar with this, right? All of us have sinned and has fallen short, right? And the wages of sin is death. Judgment has to be carried out because of sin. But because of the blood, judgment and the penalty and the punishment has been made. So basically, this is where we see the cross. When we look at the cross, what we see is the payment has been made for our sins. Now, when God looks at the cross, He sees the punishment has been made on behalf of us sinners through the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. Amen. That was, there's, that's why there's favor and there's blessing and there's lifting of curses. You and I are no longer cursed because of the cross of Christ. Amen. Come on now. Let's give the Lord a hand for that. And this is also known as the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. That God basically has called Jesus, our Passover lamb, to be the substitute for us on the cross. That we who were guilty sinners are no longer guilty of our sin, the crimes we've committed, because Jesus took the penalty of that sin. He became our substitute. He is the Passover lamb. He was the one who suffered for us on that cross. That's why when we look at the cross, all we can say is, Lord, thank you so much. I am forever grateful for the cross. I am forever grateful for the Passover lamb. I am forever grateful for the blood of Jesus that cleanses me from all sins. In Christ, the wrath of God passes over us. Because it has been poured out on Him. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise for that? That is the benefit of our salvation. You know, because of what Jesus Christ did for each and every one of us, we are no longer subject to judgment. You know, the penalty of sin is eternal damnation. Now, if you are in Christ, you are no longer condemned 
if anyone is in Christ, we are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. In fact, this is where we normally say uh, and hear this uh, statement, tetelestai. Tetelestai means the debt has been paid in full and it is finished. The sacrifice is done once and for all. No longer are we subject to God's judgment because of the finished work of Christ. In fact, our salvation is hinged upon the blood of Jesus Christ. We cannot be saved apart from the blood of Christ. It's all about the blood. Ever say, all about the blood. It's all about the blood. Because of the blood of Jesus, we are saved. I'm just going to read through very quickly some uh, verses from uh, the New Testament about the blood. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved from, uh, by Him from the wrath of God. The Bible says we are justified by His blood. We're not justified by His birth. We can celebrate Christmas, but we're not justified by the birth of Jesus. We're not justified by the teachings of Christ. We're not justified by following the teachings of Christ. We're not justified by the life of Jesus. We're justified by the blood. The blood had to be spilled. The blood had to be shed. We're justified by the blood of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, In Him we have what? Redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7, it says, The blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us. Everybody say cleanses us. Cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus is powerful. He's able to cleanse us from all our sins, past, present, and future. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to 19, it says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but what? But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. The final point this morning is this. Jesus is the perfect Passover lamb by whom we can be saved. 